Uh, thank you so much, Wickham. Uh, welcome to the final panel of what's been an absolutely exceptional day. Um, I am just going to spend today um, introducing our four speak, our five speakers we have and four papers. And um, as always, please leave any comments and questions um, available, and we will run through the papers. And at the end, we will have an open discussion about what what this what mental health in film and theory and effective politics is in regards to the slasher. Um, but first, to, to introduce our first speaker, we have uh, Valerio Svobati. Um, he has a PhD in music and performing arts from Spinezia University of Rome, where he currently is an adjunct professor of film studies. His main research interests are film, sound, and film music, spatial sound, and horror films. He has published articles in the Italian film criticism magazine, Segno Cinema, of which he is a collaborator, and in peer-reviewed journals such as Music and the Moving Image, Projections, Imagio, Synergy, and La Valle de Lieren, and Comunicatio Sociale. He has also published two monographs, Allegro Van Topo, Videre la Musica, Escolatere e Designo, and La Sogsigno de lo Spazio Sonore, Filmico, Un Approccio Neurofamiliar Gioco. He is also a musician. Valero, please, I hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here at this wonderful conference. Uh, this talk originates from my interest as a, a film scholar in horror films, on the one hand, and in the relationship between cinema and mental health, on the other, thus the disciplines of uh, psychiatry and clinical psychology. I would like to focus on two aspects of uh, this topic. First, how psychopathology can help analyzing the characters of the leisure films or the content of these films. Second, how psychopathology can help analyzing the perceivers, the audience of the leisures, or the psychological experience of watching these films. Uh, the two key questions um, as regards characters are, what can be said about slashers in psychopathological terms? And can slashers be useful in teaching psychopathology? As regards perceivers, the two key questions are, what effects can slashers have on the perceiver's mental health? And can slashers be useful in cinema therapy? As regards perceivers, uh, I'm sorry, um, in the case of uh, uh, perceivers, I started to understand a mental health in a broader sense that is not only in terms of a psychopathology or a clinically relevant symptoms of mental disorders, as I did first, but also as mental well-being, generally speaking. So let's start with characters. It has been stated many times that mentally ill persons are often stigmatized and linked ipso facto with dangerousness, especially in thriller horror films. And this, maybe it's uh, often true. Um, uh, Byrne, uh, we, who is uh, an interesting uh, person in this sense because he's both a psychiatrist and a film graduate, states that many films perpetuate public perceptions that violence is a symptom of mental illness, and he includes slashers starting from Psycho. But he also states that films depicting mental illness are not universally negative. And uh, there are no exceptions among slashers for burn, but maybe this could be at least theoretically the case. Uh, Lysed and Linkowski, two psychiatrists, uh, published an article about psychopathy and the cinema, asking themselves, is psychopathy at the cinema fact or fiction? And they state that in popular slasher films, psychopathic characters are generally unrealistic, accumulating many traits and characteristics such as sadism, intelligence, and the ability to predict the plan that the future victims will use to escape. These are more iconic popular evil representations, according to them, of fictional killers than of interesting psychopaths from a scientific psychopathological point of view. The um, uh, films that they cite, which can be uh, called uh, uh, at least partly slasher films, are Psycho, The Child's Play Series, and Scream. More recently, psychologist John Swart states that many older slasher featured antagonists with psychopathic traits 
which are not realistic. And uh, uh, she, she cites, as you can see, a character such as Jason Voorhees in the Friday the 13th franchise and Michael Myers in the Halloween series of films, which, according to her, are two better known examples of this characterization of psychopathy that diverge significantly from the accepted scientific uh, profile. And according to her, films and TV uh, programs should collaborate with mental health professionals to counter inaccurate stereotypical portrayals of psychopathy that sustain misconceptions and stigma, discourage help seeking, and ultimately impede rehabilitation initiatives. So according to her, it seems that slashers, are, slashers seem to be not useful in the context of uh, psychopathological uh, discussion. Uh, however, uh, not all uh, mental health uh, uh, professionals uh, uh, agree about this. Interestingly, in this uh, uh, article, uh, this um, group of uh, psychiatrists and psych uh, mental health professionals uh, propose a creative framework for teaching psychopathology by a metaphorical analysis of horror films. The key concept here is that of metaphor. So uh, among the horror films that they choose, there are three slasher films, Halloween, Friday the 13th, and A Nightmare on Elm Street. So they're not stating that these films are realistic, that the uh, psychopathological portrayal is, uh, uh, corresponds to what happens in reality, but they are useful if they are taken as metaphors of a mentally disturbed condition. In the case of Halloween, Michael Myers losing the ability to speak after murdering his sister represents conversion disorder, which is a case of somatoform disorder. In Friday the 13th, the legend of Jason is a metaphorical outcome of the direct effects of alcohol, specifically fetal alcohol syndrome, which is a substance-induced disorder. And finally, in the case of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, nightmares of Freddy Krueger intruding into wakefulness characterize the physiology of narcolepsy, which is a case of sleep disorder. Similarly, in another article, um, it is proposed a, a phenomenology of psychiatric disorders in horror films about demonic possession, about zombies, and once again, slasher films. As you can see, the, the same three slashers are mentioned here, along with the, uh, the grandfather, maybe, of uh, slasher Psycho. Psycho is full uh, of mother issues, and the trio of dissociation, homicidal mania, and transvestitism is present, as it will be in another um, film such as Dress to Kill, which has something to do with slasher. In the case of Halloween, uh, they convene that uh, the Halloween um, contains a case of conversion disorder, but also of voyeurism and autistic spectrum disorder. Friday the 13th is also about intellectual disablement and congenital malformations, such as fetal alcohol syndrome. In the case of A Nightmare on Elm Street, there is pedophilia, there is psychopathy, of course, and there are, once again, mother issues. So these authors conclude that slashers as teenage morality plays in which uh, should be intended, I'm sorry, as teenage morality plays in which the promiscuous teens are slashed, usually by psychopaths with mummy issues. Popular slasher films of the past half century demonstrate a tie to forensic psychiatry that is particularly strong, and they add that slashers are promising for using in therapy, as I will explain in a few moments. So I agree with the media scholar Harper, who states that, uh, uh, for example, psychiatrist Wall's uh, uh, criticism of the overrepresented link between mental illness and violence is surely valid in scientific terms, but is marred by a boulderized conception of popular culture, including slashers. So slashers should be taken as uh, relevant uh, popular forms of entertainment that should be um, analyzed uh, in more nuanced and more complex terms. Uh, so, uh, of course, allegorical interpretations may be particularly useful here. And one, one recent example is that of uh, a psychiatrist Barbera, who writes on It Follows, which is a sort of uh, a supernatural slasher, psychoanalysis and adolescent sexuality. So, of course, there is no um, um, reason to uh, look for a, a, um, a valid psychopathological uh, portrait in a film such as, as It Follows. But at the same time, there is something interesting to say in psychoanalytic and maybe psychopathological terms. 
so uh, as, as I was saying, um, us as film scholars know quite well that uh, films, uh, generally speaking, of course, not only slashers, may be and should be interpreted uh, so to um, make implicit and symptomatic meanings. And in the case of slashers, of course, the studies by Clover are quite popular. Uh, let's skip to uh, perceivers' mental health. Uh, there, are, there are some uh, um, psychiatric and psychological um, uh, article studies about uh, uh, the negative impact of uh, horror films on the, on, uh, the audience's uh, mental health. Uh, the, the, maybe the first case of such uh, studies, that of Botsuto, about uh, the cinematic neurosis following the exorcist, the exorcist. This is the first time I found uh, the concept of cinematic neurosis in the literature. Uh, of course, there has been also some debate about uh, the adolescents and the children's reactions to uh, frightful and violent television and film programs. And more recently, uh, it uh, seems that horror movies uh, can indeed uh, induce a post-traumatic stress disorder-like syndrome, in, especially in fragile uh, persons. Uh, of course, uh, slashers have been uh, he uh, heavily discussed as regards the issue of female victims, sexual violence, desensitization to violence, and link between uh, um, the fictional representation of sexual violence and uh, pornography. Uh, but once again, I would like to cite Byrne, the psychiatrist and the film graduate, who states that it is better to engage with popular culture than to pretend that uh, they, as mental health professionals, can operate outside it. His medical textbooks predicted many patients with delusions of divinity, but he has seen more young people with psychosis who re reference the Truman Show and the Matrix than higher powers. So once again, since films are a popular form of entertainment, of course, people, uh, maybe also uh, people who have uh, some sort of a mental disorder, uh, reference such films. And so the mental health professionals should be aware of what is at stake when we are speaking about uh, films, uh, horror films, celestial films. In a recent uh, review of the literature about uh, uh, psychology and horror films, Martin um, uh, um, stated that the, the, the idea of cinematic neurosis has some basis indeed, but the horror film can just be a catalyst for provoking an underlying and pre-existing pathology that would have been provoked by any other relevant stimuli. Uh, and at the same time, it seems that watching horror films can indeed lead uh, in some people to self-reported short-term anxiety and disturbed sleep. However, it is uh, improbable that such effects can be long-term. And it, it struck me in, uh, in, this, uh, in this article that uh, there, are, um, it, there seem to be different uh, psychological not necessarily psychopathological, once again, reactions uh, to uh, horror films, including slashers, um, um, differ uh, with a differentiation between uh, sex and gender. Uh, so, for example, uh, men and boys prefer to watch horror, generally speaking, and report, exp and report experiencing less fear and anxiety than uh, women and girls do. And similar uh, um, reflections can and should be made um, in, um, also in terms of other kinds of difference, differences in terms of the uh, single um, experience of people who are watching horror films, who are watching slasher films, and may have different um, psychological effects. Uh, uh, the, in, in 1990, this groundbreaking article was published, which is a case of cinema therapy ante literam. The, the authors doesn't, do not use the term of uh, cinema therapy, which was used the first time, I think, in the same year, 1990, in another article. In any case, uh, the, what they did was using a film, and surprisingly a slasher film, in the context of uh, um, uh, psychotherapy. So first of all, uh, the authors ask themselves, what are the social, psychological, or medical effects of viewing the graphical depicted violence in the popular slasher films? And many other people ask themselves so. But in this case, they had a clinical case specifically. 
Uh, a troubled 13-year-old boy who was a horror fan, he stated that he was addicted to horror. And uh, uh, one of uh, his favorite uh, characters was Freddy Krueger. So the, the two psychiatrists decided to watch uh, with him, using in, in the context of psychotherapy, the film A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. And this was quite useful in uh, uh, helping this boy in his insight about his uh, um, uh, disorders, relational uh, behavioral disorders. So their conclusion is that uh, they wish to suggest that the modern horror movie may satisfy for the adolescent the same function that the bedtime fairy tale does for a younger child. And no one would complain about the psychopathological improbability of a fairy tale. Seen in this way, the popularity of this art form can be understood rather than feared. It reflects condemnation by parents and mental health professionals of any entertainment so widely enjoyed by the lessons as modern horror movies is not only irrational, but also disrespectful of our young people. Quite a strong assertion, I believe. Um, more recently, uh, it seems that uh, horror films, and here the authors implicitly include Slasher because they speak of uh, uh, psycho killer films who slash their victims, uh, may enhance treatment for anxiety symptoms in the case of those uh, patients who love uh, watching two horror films. So uh, in this case, um, slashers and horrors may be useful in uh, treating anxiety, not anxiety, not in uh, uh, make people be more anxious. And once again, I believe that metaphor is a crucial concept because I found in the, in the literature regarding cinema therapy that metaphor is indeed relevant for uh, mental health professionals. Here are some, some references. And uh, uh, to conclude this second section, I would like to mention uh, two articles by Prokno, we, which are um, quite interesting because uh, this person makes an autosomatography, as he calls it, or an autoethnography focusing on an illness condition. And such an illness condition is that of a schizoaffective disorder. In this case, symptoms of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And surprisingly, uh, even in this case of a, a, seriously, um, of, a, of a serious disorder, psychosis, the person states that slasher films, uh, that he, he, he was able to use the slasher films as a psychoanalytic template for making sense subjectively of their alter, rather than using their madness serving as an interpretative lens for the analysis of Russian films. And the conclusion are quite illuminating. They state that through the lens of the Russian films, they were able to rethink their learning of saneness as a critical pedagogical act. And it took the Slasher subgenre and the acceptance to live with this disorder to allow them to realize that they can live without sanity. So of course, this is just one, uh, a single clinical uh, experience. This does not mean that I'm not implying that this may be true for any kind of uh, um, uh, mental disorder or schizoaffective disorder, but it is quite telling that uh, uh, this person could, uh, could was able to use slasher films uh, uh, in, in, a, in a useful manner for for him, him or herself in, uh, in dealing with a serious uh, uh, mental um, condition. So to conclude, I believe that us as uh, film scholars should contribute uh, to the study and to the use of slashers in the context of mental health because we, we can uh, um, uh, approach the matter uh, in, in, uh, in a humanistic, uh, using a humanistic perspective um, so enriching the possibility of interpreting these films and in analyzing them also in terms, not only in terms of content, uh, so uh, characters and events, but also in more complex stylistic and formal and historical terms. So I think that we, we may be part of all this uh, in terms of qualitative and quantitative analysis has, uh, has been already done um, in terms of uh, empirical psychology research, uh, in terms of bicultural perspectives, such as that of Claesen and Platz, which who I'm sorry, who write about evolution and slasher films, 
and maybe also in uh, more uh, broadly uh, philosophical terms, being of course psychology um, a soft science and such a, a, a complex uh, area of, of research. And one example is uh, Woodcock's study on the moral um, implications of watching uh, violent films, including uh, slasher films, of course. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much for that fantastic paper, Valera. It's very, very interesting. My mind is racing with questions and ideas. Um, so we're gonna we'll we'll save those for the for the discussion at the end. Um, I would love I would like to introduce our next paper um, by Caitlin Duffy. The paper is titled "If You're Not Documenting Yourself, You Just Don't Exist: The Digital Slasher." Great title. Um, Caitlin recently earned her PhD from Stony Brook University Department of English in May 2021. Congratulations. Um, her dissertation explored American Gothic fiction and horror cinema through the political framework of liberal and neoliberal theory. Caitlin's work has been published in Poe Studies, Gothic Nature, and the Journal of Dracula Studies, and an edited collection titled Trump Fiction. Caitlin has also taught courses in film, literature, and writing. Caitlin, over to you. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, great. Uh, so uh, before diving into my presentation, um, I first want to thank all of you for being here and also the organizers, Daniel Shepard and Wickham Clayton, for putting together this really exciting event on slasher studies. Um, all of the papers and discussions I've encountered so far have been really stimulating and energizing, and I look forward to whatever conversation this panel sparks. And it was really fun um, to actually have like a really uh, solid slasher event on uh, Friday the 13th yesterday. Um, so my paper begins to uh, explore and unpack what I'm going to refer here to as um, the digital slasher. Um, so in my mind, uh, these are narratives that make use of the slasher genre, uh, but with the added focus on the digital Digital. Uh, here, there are serial killers and final girls making use of digital tools, platforms, and technologies. Um, in fact, many digital slasher films not only take up the digital in their content, but also in their very form as first-person camera and or faux footage films. Um, the, although there are plenty of examples of digital slashers, such as uh, Spree, uh, Creep 1 and 2, and to an extent, the You book and television series. Um, most scholarly attention surrounding digital horror has focused predominantly on paranormal digital narratives or films focused on haunted technology, um, such as Paranormal Activity, uh, Friend Request, Unfriended, and most recently, Host. Um, and some of these movies, these more paranormal movies, incidentally, do borrow uh, slasher formulas and tropes that might even be considered um, as paranormal slashers. Um, but this presentation is more interested in uh, this top row here, so these more realist um, digital slashers. The digital slasher contends with topics and themes similar to paranormal digital horror films, uh, such as surveillance capitalism. Uh, however, they don't typically invoke the, su supernatural, the supernatural and instead are presented with as much realism as possible. And this presentation argues that the digital slasher film makes use of aesthetics central to what Catherine, Zim Catherine Zimmer terms surveillance cinema, uh, as well as motifs of the slasher genre in order to capture and critique the particular anxieties uh, associated with life in the digital age. The digital slasher film is important uh, for its materialization of internet users' complicity in surveillance practices and the digital images' unstable and indexical value. Um, so in order to dive a bit deeper into the ways in which the digital slasher can be beneficial to explore these themes, this presentation will use Spree as a case study. Um, and also it's fun to talk about Spree because, um, you know, I'm on a live stream right now and I'll be talking about a live streamer killer. <laughs> um, and also I wanted to take this moment to give a warning uh, that I will be discussing plot spoilers for Spree. Um, so if you wanna avoid spoilers, maybe, you know, step out or mute this for a moment. Okay, 
Uh, so that was your warning. So Spree is a 2020 uh, faux footage film directed by Eugene Kotliarenko. Um, it features rideshare driver Kurt Kunkel, played by Joe Keery, um, who is desperate for digital fame, so desperate, in fact, uh, that he murders his customers on a live stream. Kurt's viewers initially chastise him for providing boring and obviously fake content, uh, which prompts Kurt to commit murders that are progressively more horrific and more visually spectacular. As the night moves on, audience are introduced to Kurt's father, a struggling DJ with a drug addiction named Chris, played by David Arquette, as well as some of Kurt, Kurt's targets and victims. While Kurt initially begins the live stream killing whoever comes into his rideshare pretty much, uh, he eventually begins to seek out victims with larger followings, such as a popular live streamer who Kurt used to babysit named Bobby Bud Lee, played by Joshua Oval, and Jesse Adams, um, an insta-famous comedian played by real-life comedian Sashir Zamata. The film ends with Jesse surviving Kurt's attacks by killing him before he can kill her a climactic finale that is shared with Kurt's viewer, viewers via his ever-present live stream. Um, and based on the final credit sequence, Jesse, um, our final girl here, is able to gain even more success and fame as a comedian than she already had uh, because of her very on-camera live streamed murder of Kurt. Um, she is rebranded as a survivor and her comedy set in which she deleted all of her social media apps, ironically, goes viral. So first, uh, let's look at how Spree as an exemplar of the digital slasher film engages with the indexical value of digital images. Spree repeatedly blurs boundaries between fiction and reality, both in its plot as well as in its formal elements. So for example, the film itself was inspired by the very real uh, video uploaded by famous YouTuber Logan Paul that featured the body of a suicide victim he encountered in Japan's Aoki Kahara Forest. Kotli Aranko wanted to explore this question of what happens when digital content creators push their content to violent and antisocial extremes to gain more viewers and therefore uh, more money, more success. Um, in an interview to promote Spree at Sundance, Sashira Zamata, who again plays Jesse in the film, um, noted that what she finds most scary about Spree, um, despite its comedic moments, is that, quote, it's very realistic. Versions of this have already happened and that scares me, unquote. Um, and certainly it's hard to watch Spree and not think uh, not only of Logan Paul's offensive video, um, but also the multiple murder sprees that have been recorded and uploaded or live streamed to the internet. Um, however, even once Kurt begins actively murdering people on camera, at the start of his live stream, his audience is humiliatingly small. And Kurt is told that his content is boring, awkward, obviously fake, or like in this uh, screenshot, uh, you see people saying this is a scam. Um, and even after Kurt grows a sizable audience after taking over Bobby's streaming account, viewers type their skepticism, skepticism into the chat box, stating that Kurt and the other characters must have rehearsed this for weeks and remarking how elaborate this hoax is. Even Kurt himself has a hard time distinguishing between which images are real and which are fake online. In one of the film's more openly comedic moments, the audience joins Kurt as he re-watches one of Bobby's videos um, that Kurt thought was completely real. There are a number of obvious tells that this video is staged, including uh, a moment where Bobby himself, there he is, um, appears in the frame near the end of the video and none of the other people in the video acknowledge Bobby or the camera's close proximity, uh, despite the fact that the video claims to be an undercover prank video. Uh, when Kurt expresses shock that this video is staged, Bobby taunts him, stating that its stage status is, quote, what makes it work, unquote. And although Kurt is genuinely killing people in his live stream, it's, it's not a hoax, he is actually murdering people, um, he does put in a lot of effort to heighten the spectacle and even stage it a little bit. For example, he adds special lighting, um, he creates a special soundtrack for the event, and he even brands his live murder spree with a hashtag, hashtag the lesson, 
Um, and he even creates this, this logo for it. And beyond the film's content, the way uh, that Spree looks uh, emphasizes this tenuous relationship between the digital image and truth. Although the film was marketed as a fictional horror comedy film and didn't engage in any of the guerrilla style and transmedial marketing tactics that other faux footage films have done, uh, most notably Blair Witch, Cloverfield, um, it does take on an unnervingly realistic digital aesthetic. Uh, by the end of the film, we discover that this film we've been watching um, is meant to be understood as a best of Kurt compilation put together by a Kurt fan and posted to a 4chan board. Um, and because of this, most of the film is composed of Kurt's live stream. Um, but there's also clips from Kurt's and Bobby's YouTube videos, uh, Jesse's Instagram and other digital sources. As a result, the movie's frame often includes features of the digital applications it replicates, which you can see here, um, such as live chat streams and donation messages typical of live streaming platforms. Spree also makes use of aesthetics and themes central to Catherine Zimmer's uh, surveillance cinema. So despite social media's claim to provide users with a privileged position in which their experience and perspective determines what is valuable through the data that these platforms collect, in actuality, Zimmer argues that, quote, the very algorithm that aggregates their activity and experience in order to sell a product to them is working to replace the body as the unifying structure of a subject, unquote. In Spree, even Kurt, our homicidal protagonist who pushes most of the plot forward, is eventually controlled by the data his behavior creates and that he asks for. Um, for example, in one scene, we are shown Google's homepage as, as it appears on Kurt's phone. When he begins to type in the search bar, he is immediately offered his recent searches, such as coolest energy drink brand, LA's quietest alleys and streets, what is a Chad, and how to dispose of a dead body secretly. At another point in the film, when Kurt incapacitates Jesse, our final girl, uh, he takes a moment to return to his phone and create a poll. He asks his viewers, what should I do with Jesse? And provides the following three options, fuck, marry, or kill. Unsurprisingly, given the nature of the film's genre as a slasher, as well as the bloodthirsty interests of Kurt's viewers, kill wins the poll and Kurt attempts to obey these results. Um, and throughout the movie, uh, we see Kurt repeatedly following whatever he's told to do by the data re he receives, um, such as this order here um, to, take, to take his viewers to Uno, who's a popular DJ and influencer. Um, and many of these commands come from donation messages, which you can see here. And these don donation messages serve to explicitly tether capital gain to the self-surveillance um, that's central to Spring. Additionally, um, near the very beginning of the film, Kurt turns to one of the multiple cameras that he's rigged in his car to tell his viewers that, quote, if you're not documenting yourself, you just don't exist, unquote. Annalie Newitz argues that serial killer narratives often serve to directly engage with John Baudrillard, Jean Baudrillard's uh, discussion of commodity culture. According to Baudrillard, Cultures that are inundated with mass media and mass production lead to the flourishing of simulacra. Such a culture of simulation encourages people to understand all objects and people as simultaneously fictional and real. In fact, uh, sometimes these simulations begin to appear more real than material life does, or at least they, that's their threat. Uh, in these situations, serial killer characters might kill in order to see themselves mass produced as simulations in mass media as a means to become more real. Certainly in Kurt's world, uh, where social media and follower accounts have become the most important aspect in determining a person's value or even a person's relative level of reality or existence, um, digital simulations have become more real than reality. In, an, in engaging in a live broadcast murder spree, Kurt guarantees that his image and name will be reproduced throughout the internet, even long after his material death. One fascinating component of Kurt's quest to become more real and valuable via simulation is the hyper embodiment that the viewer of Spree is made to experience. 
Just like other first person camera horror films like The Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity, uh, Spree positions its viewer uh, primarily in the point of view of a camera or technology rather than a specific character. So we're often seeing things that only a camera can see rather than a character. Um, however, even when we see shots that only the camera can see, there is such a strong embodied connection between Kurt and his various cameras and his social media platforms that the distinction between character point of view and camera is lost, res resulting in these technologies becoming stand-ins for sort of his character or maybe even existence itself. As Zimmer notes in hyper-embodied horror films, quote, recording is what it means to remain alive, unquote. I would add that in Spree, being recorded and seen is also what it means to remain alive. Uh, this is further emphasized when Kurt takes over Bobby's live stream audience immediately after murdering Bobby. These two acts, the murder and the live stream takeover, sort of blend together. Bobby is no longer uh, recording, he's no longer seen, um, and instead Kurt becomes even more seen. He takes over Bobby's viewers, and so by becoming more seen, he becomes more alive. Uh, his audience has artificially grown, and he aims the camera on himself as he takes a shower. The camera captures extreme close-ups of his skin here, rendering Kurt hyper-visible and therefore hyper-real. Catherine Zimmer warns that hyper-embodiment can flatten experience as it provides a single technological perspective that claims new, uh, neutra neutrality um, and in doing so often uh, ignores things like race and gender. Um, and this goes back or this takes us back to this question of the di digital images relationship to truth. Um, a lot of scholars before me like Mark Freeman and James Aston um, have done a lot of work in how amateur looking video adds to the sort of realism of the film and therefore um, audiences are made to take these images as truth because they look like they were made as by an amateur, right? Um, so these first person camera films uh, present what they see, what they show as truth without considering necessarily embodied experience. Um, so near the start of Spree, a man who is on his way to speak at a white men's rights event gets in Kurt's car. Kurt informs this man that racism and misogyny, quote, isn't cool, unquote. But he adds that, uh, or he goes on to explain that it's not cool because people won't watch his live stream, quote, if there's too much racist shit in it, unquote. Once again, we see the algorithm guiding Kurt's actions and beliefs rather than any sort of moral, ethical, or political, or humanist code. Later on, however, Kurt grows increasingly jealous of Jessie, who's our final girl. Um, and Jessie is a black female comedian who has way more followers and viewers than Kurt does. Kurt monologues at one point to his camera, stating that Jessie's content, quote, isn't even relatable to him, unquote. And that he, uh, quote, just gets angry when people aren't uniform, unquote. Perhaps as a result of his status as a cisgender straight white male, Kurt assumes that his experience is more relatable and neutral and therefore more deserving of views than Jesse's is. Therefore, even as Spree makes use of the hyper embodied camera, it does push on some of the assumptions that this perspective often works from. In a very classic slasher film conclusion, serial killer Kurt and final girl Jesse face off. After multiple failed attempts, Jesse is finally able to stop Kurt's murderous rampage by killing him first. But more importantly for this film, she doesn't just kill him, but she does so while being live streamed to Kurt's audience. Standing over Kurt's dead body, Jesse picks up his phone and sees that the audience is asking her to take a selfie with him. Jesse briefly hesitates before picking up Kurt's head and posing with it for the camera. Just as countless final girls before Jesse have done, she takes control of the killer's weapon or source of power, in this case, Kurt's live stream, uh, and uses it to sort of defeat him, to take over those viewers for herself. However, what would a slasher film be without an ending that seems to suggest that the killer is still somehow alive? Uh, at the very end of Spree, we are shown various news articles and Instagram posts that reveal how Jesse uh, has become oops, have beca has become incredibly famous and wealthy as a result of murdering the so-called rideshare killer on live stream. Eventually, however, we are also shown a series of Reddit and 4chan posts 
um, that memorialize Kurt and celebrate his murder spree. Um, so I'm showing a few here. Um, uh, if in the world of spree, uh, to be recorded and seen is what it means to be alive, then this conclusion might be read as revealing that Kurt is still alive through his image's persistent presence in the digital world. Uh, so to briefly con conclude, uh, as an example of the growing digital slasher subgenre, Spree scratches at a number of complex anxieties and questions surrounding life in the digital age, including the indexical truth of the image, the blurring of materiality and virtuality, the lack of regulations which allow dangerous people and their movements to gain a following online, and the prevalence of structures and surveillance in the digital realm. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. That was absolutely spectacular. Uh, fantastic paper. Um, I, have, I have a lot to say, but I'll again save it, save it for the end. Um, just once again, a reminder to everyone listening, if you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to share them in the chat, um, in the YouTube chat. I'm taking note of those and we will ask some of those at the end. Um, but to introduce my the third paper of this panel, um, in which we have two presenters, the paper um, is titled Empathy and Identification in Postmodern Slasher, The Case of Rob Zombie, uh, another great title. Um, our first presenter is Yago Paris. Um, he graduated um, from the MA in Film Studies at Udfers Lurand, uh, Turman Yagatsum in Budapest. Um, he wrote his thesis on the aesthetics of Michael Bay's Transformers and its influence over the representation of CGI robots. Fantastic. Um, he has published an article about cinema and trauma in studies, um, sorry, in studies in Eastern European cinema and has presented papers at various conferences. Um, he is a film critic in magazines such as Cinema de Ventio, um, El Antelpeño no Timo Mojicano and Revista Insertos and collaborates with the newspaper Info Libre, um, and he is currently preparing his access to a PhD program. Um, Iago is, is joined by Ignacio Pablo Rico Gustavino. Um, he is a researcher at Juvenes de Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid, Spain, um, in the Department of Humanities, Language and Culture. He is a member of GIEVEC, which is the research group in visual arts and cultural studies, and a film critic on the magazines um, as mentioned before, Sino Di Avenche um, and Entalpa no Motimo Mojicano. Um, he is a contributor to various podcasts and the author of several books on topics um, such as Ikira Kurosawa, um, Werner Herzog, and John Casavites. Uh, thank you so much. Please, um, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Darren. Uh, can everybody see the, the shared window? Yeah, the presentation? Okay, I can see it now. Okay, so hello, hello everyone. First of all, thank you very much to Daniel and Wickham. It's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, for us to be in this Slasher Studies summer camp. And of course, thanks also to all of the people who is watching us and of course to our fellow panelists. Um, let's start with this, uh, with this paper about the empathy and, and identification in postmodern Slasher. And the case of Rob Zombie. Uh, first of all, I want to, to make a brief uh, introduction. Uh, one of the basic principles of classic uh, American cinema, or as Mark Cousin has called it, uh, of American romantic realism, is the desire to, to make uh, the viewer feel identified with a hero. Um, on many occasions, the attributes of the main characters are not er uh, heroic at all. Uh, but um, I think that the direction, the use of the soundtrack or the editing, editing make it easier for us to feel close to characters whose behavior sometimes is far, far away from society mainstream values. Um, since its origins, uh, horror movies in general and slasher films in particular have offered uh, one of the most beautiful exercises of uh, identification and empathy of the spectator with the main character. Uh, often the hero or heroine uh, is someone cornered by a psycho killer. Um, this main character uh, must fight uh, against someone more powerful than, than him or her. And even if we have never hidden in a forest or come face to face with somebody masked and armed with a knife, we know what are depths. We know what our job uh, uncertainty. We know uh, we we know what is uh, social loneliness. Uh, so 
we know about fear and we know how it feels to be trapped. And that's why it is easy for us to connect uh, with those who are suffering at the other side of the screen. So uh, I think that subgenres such as home invasion or slasher have been able to approach the anxieties of contemporary people. The most impressive thing about the, the empathy generated by slashers like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween, the, the Hills Have Eyes, uh, the Final Girls, Wrong Turn, etc., is that it doesn't matter whether those who suffer are men or women, uh, are black or white, the identity barriers between us and the hero or heroine disappear because we connect empathetically, empathetically sorry, at a very elemental and, and a very human level. Um, talk, talking about John Carpenter's Halloween, uh, brief, uh, I, I will be brief about that. I would like to bring here some reflections from the Spanish film critic Carlos Losilla, uh, as he reflected in the indispensable El Cine de Terror, an introduction, a horror film, an introduction. The condition of Michael Myers oscillated between his mythical, abstract, sub superhuman character and his concrete dimension as a man with a name and a surname. Uh, here we can see uh, a shot from the subjective uh, sequence that begins the film. Uh, we share, as the spectators, the view of Michael Myers. We see what he sees and we accompany him in what he does. And it, not, it was not the first time, of course, that a horror film used subjective shots. But on this, in this occasion, it transcends the voyeurism of Peeping Tom and similar films to discover at the end of the sequence that the killer is a masked child. So Carpenter was able to point out a central idea in modern uh, cinema that uh, Rob Zombie will develop in his, in his remake. The, the idea is that the, the spectator's uh, false innocence, his complicity with a certain politics of reality. Um, so uh, Halloween, the, the uh, remake, uh, made by the, the filmmaker uh, and musician Rob Zombie, emerges in the context of a trend uh, of the years of the uh, 2000s. I'm talking about the origin movies. Several origin movies based on classic horror films were uh, released around that time, like The Thing from 2011 or Texas uh, Chainsaw Massacre, uh, uh, 2006, if I don't remember it that. Of course, it affects not only to horror movies, uh, we have blockbusters like Batman Begins or Maleficent. Um, Jago and I are specifically in the, interested in the first half of Rob Zombie's Halloween, where the filmmaker proposes an approach to the psycho killer Michael Myers according to one of the codes of the movies of that time. And it is trying to understand the evil psychologically. But somehow, as we will see, uh, Rob Zombie is, very, uh, is being very perverse. Um, as we can see in the, in the first shot, we will meet Michael Myers for the first time wearing uh, his clown mask, uh, the clown mask he uses to, to murder his family. Well, he, he, he's wearing when he murders his family. He's not using it to murder uh, in, Carpenter, in Carpenter's film. But we will soon discover that behind that mask, behind that myth, there is a child with an innocent look. Um, it, it is a child with violent impulses, but also a tender one trapped in a dysfunctional and violent family. Zombie is uh, forcing us to try to understand someone very violent with uh, murderous instincts, but per perhaps a victim of circumstances. Um, there is a strong uh, tension between the humanization of Michael Myers and an enigmatic evilness that refers us to the original movie. Uh, when Michael commits his first crimes, okay, um, we often see him in shots that remind us of the psycho killer of the original films, as we can see here. For example, uh, and in this shot, we can see him in the distance, hiding, waiting for his victim. But soon we will discover a melancholic, lonely boy with no friends. We know that Michael Myers' madness is in part a consequence of his, simple, his uh, circumstances. But is it enough for us to, to be able to empath uh, empathize with him? Is the pity enough for us to understand the horror in which he is slowly sinking? This is one of the most important uh, questions uh, of the first half of, the, of this movie. Um, eventually, Michael will commit, uh, commit the, the crimes 
okay? And he will stop being a human child, so it will be harder for us to understand him. In this uh, incredible shot, the camera films first his face, and then it moves, it moves uh, upside to focuses on Michael from above. Now we see uh, what is in the top of his head, uh, which is the, the mask. He has transformed into, into his own mask. Dr. Loomis, who would later become the great villain of Rob Zombie's uh, Halloween saga, appears there uh, here tenderly embracing Michael, and he represents uh, the failure of traditional institutions or traditional forms of, of empathy to channel the destructive forces of uh, a disaffected youth. As spectators, we are somehow uh, forced, like him, to pity a kid who resists any form of compassion. We accompany him when he tries to understand a pain that is beyond comprehension and that cannot be explained solely through the narrative of family breakdown. Um, in, the, in the scene after the, the Michael Myers inner breakdown, we can see it in this, in this first shot, uh, he breaks down with a horrible scream. We will watch uh, later in, in, the scene, in, in the scene after that, uh, we will watch him in a, the video recordings uh, of his childhood, watch it by his mother before her suicide. We know that Michael is no longer a human, as we understand humanity, uh, but Rob Zombie's Halloween still insists uh, cru uh, cruelly <laughs> on following him and on forcing us to be with Michael as he visits his own house, as he uh, stalks and kills his victims, etc. As the first Halloween movie ends with Loris, Loris is the uh, Laurie is the um, Michael's sister, the, the the only survivor of his of his family. As um, Halloween ends with Loris uh, desperate, uh, as I was saying, um, as uh, Halloween two begins with her with her screaming again in pain. Okay, uh, both of the characters' screams, the final scream in, in the first uh, Halloween uh, movie uh, from Rob Zombie and, and, the, and the scream that begins Halloween 2, uh, associate her in some mode with, this, with the cry of despair from Michael Myers when he finally goes mad, right? Uh, here, um, Rob Zombie is, is telling us something very important. In Halloween 2, we, consta we constantly see uh, how Michael Myers is destroying the body of his victims, turning them into flesh, blood, and bones. Uh, in this shot, uh, Laurie is resurrected from the flesh uh, to begin her spiritual journey. He, she doesn't know it yet, but she, she doesn't need a psychologist. She needs to understand her past, her roots, and her destiny. Uh, and that destiny unites her with her brother Michael, who also appears as a superhuman figure, as we can see uh, in this shot, as a superhuman figure, as I was saying, uh, sometimes under an, uh, as some kind of a spiritual light. So executioner and victim are united without knowing it in the same darkness, as the, as the scream scene were uh, telling us in some way. I think there are some interesting uh, final questions that Halloween 2 offers us. And some of these questions, well, uh, Jago will go uh, uh, deeper into this, are uh, can we really understand the pain that the others are suffering? Or as Wittgenstein suggested, uh, we cannot translate into words or mass per, uh, primitive emotions. What if the empathy with the victim is as problematic as the empathy with the psycho killer? Aren't they sharing the same darkness? Uh, haven't they um, experienced the same unexpressible experiences? In the final shot of the movie, we are um, uh, looking at, at it right now, um, Laurie becomes uh, the new Michael Myers. So thank you very much. That's pretty much it. Now it's Jago's turn. Okay, so the, the next um, set of films that I would like to analyze uh, regarding Rob Zombie's filmography are the so-called Five Fry uh, trilogy, uh, which is composed of House of Thousand Corpses, The Devil's Rejects, and Free From Hell. So uh, I, I would like to, to say that uh, in a nutshell, these, these three films could be uh, considered as an evolution that goes from fearing the psychocuter uh, to empathizing with them. 
So the first one, uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, uh, I would say it's a canonical slasher film. And, and I say this because basically uh, here, the, the psycho killers are not actually the protagonists, even though they have a lot of protagonism, of course, but they are not really the ones we are following. We're following the, the victims and, um, and we empathize uh, with them. We don't really care if, if that even applies for, for a psycho killer in a slasher film. Uh, which I think it kind of does, uh, um, and we are basically talking about it in in this uh, whole presentation. But I would like to point out that uh, already from the first film, we can see the uh, a trait that is common of these characters, and it's the 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 huge uh, charisma that they have, up to the point that they become very uh, irresistible, even though that they are so destructive and, and awful. Um, and coming back to the idea of the slasher, we can see here the, the character of, of Baby, one of the uh, psycho killers. And she's basically doing what normally happens in a slasher film, which is stabbing uh, a victim with a knife. Uh, and we are uh, following the steps of the people like her, so the victims. Uh, as a result, comparing this film with the, the ones uh, explained before with, uh, by Ignacio, I, I would say that this film is directly connected to Halloween. So we can see you know, in this very famous uh, assassination, we can see again the, the traits, uh, basic traits of the slasher. So we can, as a result, uh, consider very easily that uh, the first film is a canonical slasher film, but this changes uh from the second one uh the devil's uh, rejects um uh, i would uh define it as uh as a as an evolution from from the 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 psycho killers being the killers to becoming the victims uh and we can see that uh basically starting with the point that uh, they become the protagonists of the film so we start to know more and more about them. And as we can see already in this image, they are also going to suffer. So in a way, this is a, a way of, of uh, enhancing our empathy because we see them suffering, not only having fun by, by killing others. So it's true at the beginning of the film, the first part, they are basically doing that. They are terrorizing people, kidnapping them and mm, murdering them just for the fun of it, but uh, everything changes during the second part when an, an actual policeman uh, decides to behave the same way they are uh, behaving. So he starts terrorizing them and torturing them and he wants to kill them. And uh, the point where the actual uh, switch gets, uh, uh, gets uh, it, Ex uh, express in its huge uh, uh, in a in a huge way is in this in these two very similar shots. This is the one from from the first film, and this is the one from the Devil's Rejects. And it's the same framing. It's actually the same place because it's it's the yard, and it's the same position of the killer and the victim. But there's a a, a crucial change here. Baby acts as the killer whereas here uh, she's the victim so here the 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 change is is uh, um, materialized and uh, when it comes to comparing it to the previous films uh, I will I would establish a clear connection between the second part of Halloween and this one because both films are going deep into the psychology and the lives of these characters even though they are wicked, especially, of course, in the case of the Devil's Rejects, because they are already psychopaths. Uh, in, in, the, in Halloween's film, there's like the suggestion that this is going to happen, but it, 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 it doesn't really materialize. But the connection is there. So how, how empathy can make us care about characters that are uh, very problematic. Following uh, to, the, to the third one, 
of this uh, trilogy is uh, Three from Hell. And uh, the idea of empathy goes uh, uh, even further uh, up to achieving the point of identification. Uh, the film in that sense is very interesting because uh, it's not only that we know more about them, it's, it's that they actually become heroes in a traditional sense because they have to overcome a set of obstacles and they have to confront uh, villains so so that they can succeed. So uh, I would call this film as uh, having fun with the psycho killers because still, uh, as it happened in the previous one, during the first part of the film, they're acting as, as psycho killers, but then uh, the situation changes uh, again in the second part. So um, talking about these obstacles, uh, we have the, the many uh, challenges that they have to confront during the, the course of the film. So first of all, they have to survive the, the shooting with the, with the police. Then they have to escape from prison. And then they have to confront a gang of sicarios in, when they are in, in Mexico. And after killing them and after, after killing the, the boss of this gang, the, this is the last shot of the film. We can see here the fire, uh, the, the, the boss is, is uh, burning in flames at this point, and they are uh, leaving the place in a victorious way and in a very uh, sarcastic uh, way. Uh, uh, Rap Zombie does something that, that it's uh, kind of like a, a, a subtle joke. Uh, he adds uh, this uh, street dog and, and uh, so while they're walking away, the dog joins them and as a way of kind of uh, reinforcing the idea that they are the heroes, they can be trusted and, and they are the, the good guys. So uh, when it comes to the comparison, I see a clear connection between the first the first part of the first film of Halloween, by also by Rob Zombie, because we are basically, uh, like the narrative is built up in a way that we are constantly following uh, the psycho killer and we get to understand uh, their, their suffering and they can, we kind of subconsciously want them to succeed because we have seen them suffering. So we also want them to, uh, succeed, which, which is one of the key uh, aspects of any, any given uh, classical narrative. So uh, in conclusion, uh, what we have tried to expose in, in this uh, presentation is how uh, Rob Zombie uh, plays in a perverse way with the uh, identification and empathy principles, uh, which are inherent in American cinema and by forcing uh, his audience to understand uh, psychopathic characters, uh, he's uh, questioning the morality uh, of narration. And uh, as we have exposed, uh, these ideas uh, were, were used uh, to analyze uh, the Halloween diptych, Halloween and Halloween 2, and the Firefly trilogy, House of uh, Thousand Corpses, the Devil's Rejects, and Three from Hell. So that's all. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope you found this uh, presentation stimulating. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, a complete a complete change in my perspective on Rob Zombie's film that I had quite a strong reaction to when I first saw them. So um, definitely interesting points of discussion for there later. Um, so lastly, we on to, on to our four the panel um the paper is titled the queer woman as outsider in high tension and knife plus heart um this is going to be presented by dr tosha taylor um published work included several studies on queer sexualities in the american horror story book um chapters on the rural hill hillbilly figure in horror the creation of the dissemination of horror fact Horror, sorry, horror artifacts in digital culture, extreme horror, and feminist camp in Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Um, her forthcoming works include studies of gender, identity, and trauma in a number of Japanese horror comics. She holds a PhD from Loughborough University. Um, Tasha, over to you. Thank you. 
Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for all the fascinating presentations we've seen through this conference. And a big, big thank you to Daniel and Wickham for putting this together and making it so easily available. Honestly, I hope that this is the future of conferences. This presentation is a very abbreviated version of a longer piece that I'm writing on two post 2000s French slasher films, Alexandre Aja's High Tension and Jan Gonzalez's Knife Plus Heart. These films differ greatly in their aesthetics and narratives with High Tension serving as an early example of the new French extremity subgenre and Knife Plus Heart hearkening back to Giallo and garnering early critical interest as an allegory for the AIDS epidemic with its setting in the 1979 gay porn scene. My primary interest in these films regards their contextualization within both slasher and queer histories, especially at a time when our understandings of these are becoming more complex and nuanced. In many ways, these films complicate the common tropes of the slasher and subsequently common themes in scholarship on the genre. These films are also notable for depicting adult queer women rather than teenage girls. But ultimately, rather than offering a solid thesis, my argument is one of ambivalence. <laughs> Both films present interesting and complex representations of queerness, but those representations may equally be interpreted as problematic, particularly if we focus specifically on queer women. And indeed, while writing this project, I've gone back and forth on how I interpret them, both as a scholar and as a spectator. Yet their ambivalence may actually add to the liminality that is so intrinsic in representations and experiences of queerness, as I hope to demonstrate here. There are a number of competing definitions of queer horror or the queer slasher. By some definitions, A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, can be described as a queer slasher. By other definitions, it is a slasher with a queer subtext, but not a queer slasher. Conversely, 2004's Hellbent, which was marketed as the first gay slasher or first queer slasher, may not warrant the label, according to Claire Cisco King, because, she argues, it ultimately fails to engage in queer politics that subvert heteronormative paradigms. And as some critics have noted, while Hellbent was originally conceptualized in 2000, the film itself was predated by high tension, as well as a number of relevant 1980s slasher films. Some promotions have thus amended Hellbent's claim to focus more on its open queerness, thus providing another layer to the question of how we define this. we may better understand Hellbent's marketing and thus come to the location of high tension and knife plus heart within queer horror by noting that queer women have been less recognized in queer histories and film scholarship, including horror film scholarship. Foundational studies of the slasher, such as that by Carol Clover, have provided valuable starting points for conceptualizing gender in the horror film. This foundational scholarship has since come into contention for basing significant arguments on the presumption of heterosexual male spectatorship. So too have studies of queer history and respectively, queer film studies primarily conceptualize the terms queerness and also gayness through depictions of men. For instance, Darren Elliott Smith's fascinating discussion of queer masculinity defines the gay exploitation film as one that is quote, by gay male or queer identified directors, end quote, and which appeals to, quote, gay male horror fans, end quote. If we turn our focus to queer women, we find debates that are, in all honesty, exhaustingly complex and individualized. Critics writing specifically on queer women offer very little consensus, with some, like Lucille Cairns, arguing for the inclusion of women in the term gay, and others, such as Terry Castle, avoiding using the terms gay and queer partly out of response to even such significant gender and queer theorists as Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick being reluctant to acknowledge queer women in their writing as experiencing some of the same forms and degrees of oppression as queer men. 
This is especially true for lesbians and other women on film who are depicted as having no romantic or sexual connection to men whatsoever, uh, such as Marie, the seeming heroine and the villain of High Tension, and Anne, the primary focalizer of Knife Plus Heart. While our understanding of women's sexuality is growing increasingly complex, lesbian scholarship and characters offer a rich foundation for approaching the multiplicity of women's sexualities. Yet this terminology is no less fraught with debates on the noun versus adjectival cases reg regaining popularity. And despite these debates, I will be using the term in both cases here as a convenient and relevant shorthand. Placing competing studies of queer experience and women in horror into conversation with each other, we find that even the so-called lesbian vampire, whom Harry Benshoff identifies as a rare exception to horror's neglect of queer women, still exists largely to appeal to a heterosexual male gaze, and simultaneously may not exist as widely as we've thought at all. In this way, even the language used to discuss queer women offers a little sense of cohesive community or uncontentious presence in horror scholarship. The impression is that we especially don't know what to do with women who are not clearly sexually linked to men, relegating them to an uncomfortable liminal space. Both High Tension and Knife Plus Heart present queer focalization through characters who appear readable as lesbian, while staying true to some of the classic patterns of the slasher as set out by Carol Clover, Robin Wood, and Veridica. One such adherence is the equation of the monster with repressed desire. The monster has long been interpreted as an embodiment of repressed desire, whether the protagonist or the spectators, with Robin Wood, Carol Clover, and Barbara Creed all respectively discussing this interpretation at length. High Tension's climax reveals that the male slasher killer from whom Marie has been trying to rescue her friend Alex is in fact Marie herself, driven mad by her unvoiced and unrequited desire for Alex. Similarly, in Knife Plus Heart, porn director Anne discovers that the masked slasher killer who has been picking off members of her cast in sexually charged fashion is actually a queer man himself. The monster becomes sympathetic here as we learn that the killer was castrated and burned by his own father after being caught with another boy and has fixated on Anne's cast because one of her previous films uncannily resembled his life, only with a happy ending rather than a traumatic one. Yet while Knife Plus Heart's killer is actually male, film, both films establish their lesbian main characters as threats. Faced with Alex's insistence on talking about men and her concern that Marie is missing out on life by, for reasons unknown to Alex, not dating them, Marie is unable to confess her feelings and instead resorts to murder, abduction, and a sexual assault that was eventually toned down in the script. And meanwhile, is a dysfunctional alcoholic who financially exploits her cast, harasses her ex-girlfriend Lois, and sexually assaults her. Her erratic behavior even creates a suggestion early on in the film that she may be the killer. This violent suggestion remains present even after it's clear that she isn't the killer when she casts herself in a film as a woman whose identity has been so destabilized by being constantly surrounded by gay men that she, wishing to become one of them, begins killing them. These characterizations reflect and do not necessarily subvert cultural intersections of homophobia and misogyny. In modern history, desire between women has been equated with mental illness, which has notably contributed to the dearth of historical materials on lesbians and bisexual women relative to their male counterparts. Psychoanalytic treatments of lesbianism, for instance, often focus on narcissism, encouraging links between lesbians and prohibited sexual practices, such as masturbation, that prevent the achievement of female adulthood. The lesbian on film, then, is practically guaranteed an unhappy, often violent ending. And such endings are depicted as righteous and deserved within their narratives, as the lesbian herself is a destructive person. 
In life and in fiction, these discourses characterize lesbians as being prone to violent moods and actions that are the natural result of lesbian inclinations. A woman, as we see in High Tension, doesn't happen to be a lesbian who kills. She kills because she's a lesbian. Similarly, Anne's loneliness and even the murder of her ex-girlfriend by the masked killer seem punitive in light of her unsympathetic behavior. Across cinematic genres, stereotypes of what Jack Halberstam calls the predatory dyke abound, and horror is no exception, as these two films show us. However, Gothic and horror media are perhaps the ideal home for complex explorations of the experiences and identities of lesbian women and other queer women. And indeed, these women have been described by multiple scholars as ghosts. Acknowledging the disparity between scholarly and popular interest in queer men versus interest in queer women who are not presented to the audience as a means of appealing to a fetishistic heterosexual male gaze, Palmer calls our attention to the multiple meanings of a word that has been significant in horror studies and has already been significant in this presentation, unspeakable, which can refer not only to what is feared and repressed, but also to an inability to articulate an experience. Here again, we arrive at the repression that is so studied in the slasher. Palmer contends that the, quote, repressed desires and anxieties, end quote, of the Gothic are, quote, of central importance to the lesbian subject who, lacking a history and a language to articulate her sexual orientation, may feel haunted by emotions which she cannot or dare not articulate." End quote. Without adequate language and cultural recognition, this figure can only exist on the periphery. The lesbian's position outside heteronormative patriarchy and the politics of her resulting further alienation align her with the spectral. Furthermore, with queer theory and culture's focus on gay men, she occupies a similarly liminal space, even within the realms of queerness. Both films here draw attention to this liminality in multiple ways, including having Marie and Anne both primarily conceptualize sexuality through images of men. The rest of this presentation focuses on the ways that these films contribute to the tendency in horror to figure queer women and particularly lesbian women as lonely outsiders lacking cohesion and community even within queer spaces. High Tension visually focuses on Marie's somewhat solo journey as she attempts to rescue her friend, which in itself imparts a sense of loneliness. But even earlier in the film, wide shots emphasize Marie as an outsider, never quite in line with her normative surroundings. She remains apart from Alex's family, even as they welcome her into their home. And afterwards, she remains a loner. When she sits on a swing set outside the home, unusual lighting that we can see um, on the upper right hand side, creates a further visual contrast between her and the wide empty space around her. Here, she also engages in voyeurism by secretly watching as Alex showers in front of a window. Instead of seeking Alex's company out afterward, she goes to the guest bedroom to masturbate. When the imagined killer arrives, her earliest efforts are to conceal signs of her own presence so as to avoid his notice, thereby appearing to merely haunt the family's home. Knife plus heart continuously isolates women in the frame. While men are most often depicted in physically and emotionally intimate groupings, women are more often depicted alone, as we see in several shots of Anne like those shown here. Notably, in three of these shots, she is not actually alone in her environment, but she is notably offset from the others. Even when she is not offset, she's never truly part of the communal experience. And these two group shots, for instance, both occurring in queer clubs, Anne is still depicted as incapable of relating to others. And while the presence of queer women enjoying each other's company in these shots may seem to complicate this reading, these environments are far less frequent in the film. Moreover, Anne serving as the primary focalizer of queer women's experience keeps us aware that these communal moments are fleeting at best. This isolation does not merely characterize Anne. 
Wide shots of isolated queer or queer coded women are a conspicuous theme in the film. Some, like the first shot of Moon up in the upper left hand corner, are interrupted by the arrival of queer partners, but these interruptions still lack the sense of intimacy that so powerfully connects the film's men. The last sighting of each of these women occurs with either death or abandonment. The film further presents non cis heteronormative queer womanhood more generally as a liminal state of alienation through the death of Misha, a trans woman whose orientation is not rigidly defined, who once performed in Anne's films. When Misha leaves a mixed gender queer group to sit with the clearly distressed Anne, she becomes marked for abandonment and death. A storm suddenly arises, Lois takes Anne aside, and Misha watches as she herself is left behind by the larger group. Though she calls out for them, they don't answer. It is in these circumstances that the killer finds Misha and murders her. The figurative lesbian ghost becomes literal in the final scene. On a surreal porn set, Anne is interrupted by the ghostly appearance of Lois and the two reconcile with a kiss. This reconciliation is abruptly ended as a male crew member pulls Anne back toward the camera, underscoring the ghost's temporality and relegating lesbian relations to haunting memory. This brief cathartic connection between queer women is further disrupted by an abrupt darkening of the set as a somber mood falls over the men, suggesting, as a number of reviewers pointed out, that they will soon be lost to the AIDS epidemic. On one hand, this could be a powerful allegory, and in the film it is indeed a very visually beautiful moment. On the other, it creates a sense that the role of queer women is ultimately to bear witness to and to facilitate queer male relations rather than having complex, historically significant experiences of their own. And this is quite an unsettling question that the film leaves us with as it ends. All right, so um, when it comes to film and literature, I'm always interested in what got left on the cutting room floor, uh, especially since uh, this presentation is part of a larger project, as a lot of these are. Um, so some of the subtopics that um, don't quite make it into this presentation are listed here. These do get more attention in the actual full paper. And finally, these are the references for the full paper. And some of them actually did get name dropped in the presentation. And the ones that didn't, hopefully will appear in print sometime. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I, think, I think it was the perfect, the perfect paper to kind of round off this discussion, which was definitely a discussion of, uh, of separation in, in a lot of the bars, but also some fascinating crossovers kind of, you know, just bubbling beneath the surface between these various papers. Um, there have been a few questions um, in the comment in the YouTube comment section that I think we'll start and we'll raise those first. Um, once those have gone through, I'll ask some of my own questions that I have rattling around in my own head at the moment. Um, once again, anyone watching, if you have any questions, please feel free to share them onto the YouTube live stream, and I'll get to those as soon as I possibly can. Um, but the first the first question I do have here was for Caitlin. Um, the paper got quite a response, and the question is from Shelley McMurdo, and she asks, would you position the den as a digital slasher? There's definitely a link in terms of characters feeling that they only really exist online. Yeah, um, I hate to say this, I haven't watched the den yet, but it is on my sort of list of movies I want to watch, so I'll have to get back to you on that, Shelley. <laughs> But thank you for the recommendation. Um, and then there was actually a, a follow-up question that says, do you feel films like Diary of the Dead and Scream 4 are films that lead to the digital slasher with their experiments with early tech and technology? Um, that, that was asked by Victoria Timpanaro. Sure. Um, so uh, Diary of the Dead, I haven't watched in a really long time. Um, but in terms of Scream, I think Scream as like a whole franchise is, is really great to look at with technology. I think there's an, uh, an article on the first Scream um, on Horror Homeroom. I believe Don Keatley wrote it. Um, but it's about sort of like the 
like post-humanism in Scream and thinking about um, Billy Loomis as sort of part machine, part human, um, like his connection to the to the cellular phone, um, as well as to that like voice changing um, thing that they use, um, and also just all the media references as well. So I think Scream as a franchise is really interesting to look at as maybe like a precursor to these more explicitly digital um, slasher films. And then in terms too of my title or my term digital slasher, I'm not necessarily tied to it. Um, but it's something I'm, I'm definitely starting to sort of explore. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's any explicit rules of what makes something digital slasher or, or not in my mind, at least not yet. Okay, that's okay. And um, yeah, I mean, just, just to, to add into that, um, just with my own kind of question, while, while you have your mark on, um, do, do you think there's almost something almost post-human in, in both the killers and the victims in films like this, when there's there's such a strong relationship between the technology and how they kind of reflect reflect both into and through the technology they are using? Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's something that sort of got me into the, or interested in asking this question um, in the first place. So diving into what happens when there is such a focus on the digital in a slasher film, um, especially since slasher films are so concerned with the materiality of the body. I think it's fascinating um, when we get these um, little spaces to explore that in. And I, um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question completely. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's really interesting. And I think that's a really key part of like post, post-humanism, post-modernism, but um, I was mainly thinking about post-humanism um, in approaching this this question so yeah that that blend of embodiment but also virtuality um is what sort of draws me to this topic yeah yeah i think i think that i think that 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 thought i mean you mentioned embodiment there and i think that's something that definitely kind of steps through the papers we've had today mm. uh, i think that i think that the reading of horror has kind of almost fundamentally changed ever since kind of you know what patricia clark was the effective turn in like the 1990s and all the rest um there's actually there's actually a question that i had myself that i wanted to to uh, raise to iago and ignacio i'm um, talking about rob zombie a film that i i, I can't say I'm, I'm i encountered that film um i had very strong reaction to it initially and i think i think it's a film that a lot of people when they first watch it they're not really sure what to make of and I think what your papers did really well is you articulated something implicit within that. Um, but one thing I'd like to know is that you speak a lot about this about this kind of narrative transition in the film. So there's a lot of the idea of either beginning as a victim and becoming kind of the psycho killer or the killer or or the killers who kind of we develop an empathy through through the narrative in the Firefly trilogy. Um, but my question, my question is. Um, do you think that Rob Zombie not only does this in terms of narrative, but do you think that he makes more specific, I guess, formal or aesthetic choices in his filmmaking to kind of convey these 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 messages? I mean, Rob Zombie definitely has a certain character and a different st uh, style to his film. And um, it's interesting to see if that's something that you noticed while you were kind of conducting your analysis there. Oh, well, for sure, at, at least uh, in in terms of, of narrative, uh, in my impression is it's playing with uh, in a postmodern way, playing with with narrative and 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 how in the end it has a lot of manipulation. Uh, you can play with that. So, like in in that sense, the evolutions make a lot of sense because you are watching exactly the same character turning from one thing to the other. And it's still the same character. It's just that we're you're, you're seeing different sides of it. And uh, in terms of aesthetics, for sure, uh, I would say that there's a, a clear evolution in the in the part that I that I studied the the Firefly trilogy, because it starts as a very uh, uh, creepy, dark um, um, slasher horror. All, all of the types of, of horror films you can imagine in the first one. And then it little by little evolves into more of a thriller, which allows these bad characters to have other spaces to explore. And by ex exploring other spaces, their vision, I mean, the vision we have of them changes 
up to the point that even like the the last part of the of the third film it's kind of more of a western kind of so it's it still has i mean a narrative in a narratological sense, it can be still considered a slasher, at least the first part of it. But yeah, I mean, I think he's he clearly knows a lot about uh, about horror films, and and I think he's quite a uh, uh, and um, how to say that he he not only knows about it, but he's very creative in the way of developing this, this idea. So as a result, the films are intellectual, but are also uh, very, very and crudely cinematographic. And I just realized I've been talking a lot and not uh, leaving space for Ignacio, so I'm sorry. No, 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 that's, I think that's great. Um, sorry. Ignacio, sorry, were you going to say something? No, no, it's okay. I think that Jago uh, said everything I, I think. Uh, so um, I, I find interesting the way that uh, Rob Zombie um, understands uh, demythification. Uh, I, I don't know even if that word exists, so sorry. <laughs> demythification of part of the um, postmodern uh, battle with the, with the myth. He in the in the first Halloween film is um, the, the constructing the, the the cultural myth of Michael Myers in in his own context, and in the second film he is uh, giving the um, the character the well the, the characters the villain and the and the victim and a spirit a, a new spiritual way to 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 search. Um, new forms of identity and new forms of understanding humanity uh, in our times where the figures of the victim and the uh, figure of the the butcher of the killer are um uh, being discussed one uh, once and uh, once again uh, in, in in the times we are living but um, i think that in very simple terms and i guess Tommy is a uh, like um, working uh, in a conscious manner to redefine these concepts and to uh, show us how problematic can can uh, they be? Okay, I think I think that yeah. I mean, I think that's I think I mean for me. I mean, you you both mentioned how Rob Zombie's film of postmodern kind of one of the one of the, the kind of classic traits of postmodernism is this idea of kind of subverting and playing with genre. And it's interesting how he connects those almost changes in genre in terms of changes in identity to the character. Um, so there's there's definitely a complexity there, which I think that a lot of people don't give Rob Zombie enough credit for. Um, I think there's quite a lot of dismissiveness to his movies that he that is completely undeserved. Um, but I, I would like to kind of step to kind of keep with this idea of identity, Valerio, and just kind of go back to your paper. Um, this idea of, of of almost the pedagogical possibilities of of slasher forms for for teaching about psychotherapy. Um, there weren't many questions during your paper, but there was there was quite a lot of discussion um, in the chat while you were talking on how how people have, have done research on how jo horror genres and slasher genres and slash into Jason genres actually help people deal with kind of traumas and deal with difficulties. Um, there was one comment about how a lot of people who are dealing now with our current uh, situation, and that's all I'll say about it, um, horror fans find this situation easier, which I'm not sure about, but there's something in that there. Um, but but do you think do you think there's a connection there between between how we could use a slasher, a slasher uh, film to to teach psychotherapy and teach this discipline, but also how these films maybe help people or assist people in their kind of just general day to day mental health and their day to day lives. Thank you, Darren. I think that the matter is uh, uh, so complex, and there is so much. Uh, um, differences in the in the subjective uh, uh, reactions to uh, stimuli such as uh, horror films slash films that uh, um, it is it is difficult to make uh, um, conclusions that are uh, valid in, in general terms and the the, the the scientific literature at the moment shows that there are many variables. There are people who feel that um, horror films make them more anxious. They they feel distress when watching a horror film or after after having watched it. 
Then there are those people who uh, find that horror films help them in uh, dealing with uh, uh, anxiety. Uh, so it's um, I, I would I noticed that someone uh, made some reflection about the the issue of uh, of gender and uh, the spectatorship and horror films, uh, and that is an interesting topic as well. Um, of course, many research has been done, but maybe it's not uh, enough uh, uh, up to date. Uh, of course, audiences change, audiences evolve, spectatorship uh, evolves during time. So. Uh, maybe what was uh, true uh, 10 or 20 years ago is not true anymore in terms of, in that case, um, uh, gender um, dominance about uh, gendered reactions to our films. Uh, and uh, if, if we are think about the COVID-19 pandemic, then also in this sense, uh, I read something about the uh, the, the cabin fever that uh, this uh, this uh, pandemic uh, made many people feel, which is something that is uh, clinically relevant, of course. And when we say cabin fever, we are already evoking uh, horror scenarios. There is a film which is <laughs> called Cabin Fever. Uh, yeah. The Shining uh, speaks of uh, a cabin fever. There, there is a, there is a dialogue that mentions cabin fever. So maybe once again, uh, there, there may be people who, who are suffering from cabin fever and the watching horror films uh, would make them even more distressed. But uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, there may be people like me or maybe many of, of you here uh, that while watching a, a, a horror film and maybe uh, distressed characters because of cabin fever during the COVID-19 pandemic, we sort of feel relieved uh, because we, we, we do not feel alone. And, and so once again, there is this uh, tension between two uh, opposite explanations uh, of, of such topic, whether the, uh, the, the horrors on screen uh, make people, uh, well, more generally speaking, um, horror narratives make people more um, distressed some way. Um, or if uh, uh, this this kind of narrative make people uh, deal with uh, with uh, with this trauma with uh, uh, mental distress, and uh, uh, there is some research going on, I believe, uh, about this. And of course, it is it is difficult to make uh, uh, generalized uh, conclusions about this. Yeah, that yeah, I think that's. A, I mean, you you are you are hundred percent correct. Uh, I know Tasha used the phrase in her in her paper about being exhaustively complex, and I felt that statement in my very soul. Um, and I think it's something we all can kind of relate to. Um, another thing that's interesting about that is I think there's something there, there would be quite, something quite interesting about the harp cycle related to mental health and horror, and the harp cycle related to to mobile devices, which I know Caitlin uh, touched on earlier. But um, don't get me started because uh, there's there's suddenly been a so a few questions in for Tasha that I just want to raise. Uh, one question by someone named Daniel um, from Slasher Studies. I'm not really sure who that is, but um, uh, the question is, uh, what are the implications of men so frequently writing, directing these representations of queer women, be them straight writers, straight writer directors such as High Tension, or gay bar writers directors such as Knife Plus Heart? And while these representations are problematic, to what extent do you think that the actors have autonomy over how they represent these characters? Wow. That is, that's a really, really great question. Um, I, I'll admit, I'm not one of those people who thinks that a person should only direct a film if the content of the film is part of their personal identity. I'm, I personally have seen plenty of media that focus on queer women created by queer women that sucked, honestly. Um, like, just, so I feel that personal identity doesn't necessarily equal quality on it. Um, but where where I think where I think that we we kind of want to dig a little bit deeper, ask more of those questions, is you know if we're if we're considering whether or not a director, regardless of their identity, when they're representing someone who is not their own identity, how how knowledgeable are they about what they're representing? How much work have they done? Have they you know, work with people within that specific sub community to try to bring forward um, an authentic representation. Is that even a priority for them? 
and then um, you know I have this I have the same feeling toward uh, toward performers honestly um, you know there's been lots of cases where you want to think that the performer's personal identity will create a kind of resonance with a character and sometimes it does and it's beautiful and sometimes it just falls flat and you're like I'm really embarrassed right now watching this um, so I I feel that it's it's a really complex situation and a really complex um, a really complex question. I think that as our understanding of all this becomes more complex, becomes more nuanced, we're actually going to see a greater ability in people to uh, to represent identities that aren't necessarily their own. I think that we're going to see more calls for identities to be represented by people who you know for whom that is their personal identity. Um, but I I do um, I do ultimately like I'm not. I'm not quite sure what the ideal what the ideal case would be because I think I think there's a lot of complexity and nuance and really complicated stuff when we when we start looking for that. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, long rambling answer. No, 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 no. It's it's I like you know it's 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 a complex. It's a it's one of the most complex kind of classic debates through artful and media studies. You know. Um, there are, I know, I know we are, we are kind of running a bit short on time, but there's some very good questions and I'd be remiss not to get to them. So, um, there's one more from, from Eric Brinkman, um, also to Tasha, he, he would like to know what you, your thoughts about Marie as a final girl, um, if she would like, or if you have time, to, any words on that? Oh, wow. Yeah. There's actually a whole section in the larger paper about reading Marie as the final girl. Um, I unfortunately had to, uh, it got the axe. I'm sorry. Um, but I, I think she's actually a really interesting complication to the final girl because her journey lines up so well. And then when we when it's revealed at, toward the very end that, oh, she's actually the monster as well, um, it, it really flies in the face of what we want the final girl to be. And especially if we consider that um, those assumptions of the spectator's identification with the final girl that we see in so much foundational scholarship on the slasher, then, I mean, we've got a really nice slap in the face in a way, um, because then, you know, we're suddenly you know, pose with the idea of, okay, have we been relating to her this entire time while she's the one who's been doing it? What the hell, honestly? And um, I, I think she's actually a fascinating final girl. Yeah, there, there were a few, there were a few comments and chats about, I think you actually, but in your answer to that one, you actually addressed another question by someone, um, a whole, whole, um, who spoke about the same thing about how does Marie kind of revise these conventions, but um, I'm just, double check in our time. Um, there's just one more one more kind of specific question and we'll we'll open up to, I mean, I'm sure you all have questions for each other. Um, but another one for Tasha is, um, again, how has representation behind the camera helped or will help to evolve the portrayal of queer women in horror and help move further away from demonization? Are there new films to look for? So this is a recommendation question, it seems to be. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna admit, I'm usually actually a little bit, a little bit behind the times on recommendations, and one reason for that is because um, obviously this is a topic that really resonates with me personally. I usually find that I get really annoyed when I'm watching something or reading something, so I, I don't tend to prioritize a lot of, a lot of these things on my watch list. And um, someone who'll be speaking um, at this conference even let me know the other day privately, like, hey, you might want to check out this movie because it's got something I know that you're into into it here. Um, but I, um, let's see, for recommendations, what do I actually like? This is, oh, that's a hard question. Um, I don't know, like I, wow, it's like I'm going, I'm having like a completely that's empty a, moment here I and I, I and that is that is in no way shape or form an implication about the quality of other queer films it's just literally me being like oh yeah wow i've been thinking so much about high tension and knife plus heart that my brain has erased all other media right now so i mean it might be i mean it might be worth it like i mean we've, we've got the discord open for mm -hmm. for a lot of people to put your own recommendations in there i'm sure it'll be a great place to discuss sure and, and talk mm -hmm. about that um, it's, that seems to be one of those questions that you you think about something five minutes after 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 it's happened, which I completely appreciate. 
Um, but yeah, o overall, a great, great selection of uh, papers. Uh, I think a really, really great panel. Um, to hand back over to Wickham and Daniel, who I think have some closing words. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. That was a really a, a tremendously engaging uh, panel. And thank you so much, Darren, for, for chairing it uh, so well.